Good morning. My name is Alan Pangborn. I'm the CEO at Chesapeake Gold, and I'm here today to talk with Matt about the PEA that just came out that shows that we have a, a credible, financeable, deliverable, and then most importantly, expandable project based on this new technology at the Matadas project, which is an absolutely huge deposit, 20 million ounces of silver, 500, sorry, 20 million ounces of gold, 550 million ounces of silver in Durango, Mexico. Matt, great to be back again. Good and, to have uh, you back so soon. As far as <laughs> very soon. But look, I, I do want to talk to you about the PEA, and I do want to talk to, about, to you about how tests are going. But I'm going to start with um, something which I think perhaps passed most people by, which was the press release on the drilling. I'm not sure I understood the significance of it until I read it again, it might be worth kind of just going over that. So why did you put out that press release? Because most people are going, you've got enough ounces in the ground. Why more drilling? Well, never enough. But anyway, <laughs> no, the, the, the simple reason is those holes were put in the high-grade core. We did it deliberately to get the samples that we need for the MET test work. The surprise was they were 18% higher than the block model said. Now, what that means is every pit you run, every economic scenario you run, it always wants to start there. That's the higher grade margin, margin, margin all. But an 18% in, in there is right at the start of the mine plan. So it's the first stuff we mine. So 18% increase implies an 18% increase in production of gold and silver for nothing. It's the same to mine it. It's the same to process it. Everything is the same, except you're now getting 18 to 20% more gold and silver. So instead of 112, 110,000 ounces a year, it's equivalent of 130,000 ounces or 135,000 ounces a year, or it's the equivalent of a $200 increase in the gold price because of the extra revenue that comes early in the mine plan. And when it's early in the mine plan like that, it has a massive impact on MPV and IRR. That's why we put that press release out. That's why we're talking about doing an infill drilling program around that to better understand when we run the PFS that that's included. So there was a kind of surprise to you. It must have been because I know I know you were yeah. trying to get samples from different parts of the property for your test work. So those numbers came back. How has that affected uh, like mine planning, for instance? Has it? It doesn't. It that's that's the thing. It doesn't change the plan as far as where the pit starts. It starts in the same place every time. You know, lots of companies, they rent, rerun, rerun, rerun their mine plans. Unless you get something like I hit high grade somewhere else, we, we knew that the pits always started around that intrusive and the high grade section. They always do. They always will. Yeah. What we didn't know was that it was 18% higher grade. Yeah. And that just shows that we need to do some infill drilling around it because those grades were so much better than we expected. And it wasn't just one hole. It was multiple holes. Okay. I'll kind of come back to that point, but I want to kind of talk about a few other things first of all. Okay. So um, we better start with the PA because that's, that's the reason you called. You said you were going to deliver it around now. You have. So give, give us the highlight numbers um, and then perhaps what your thoughts are around it so we're really happy with what it showed it showed what we've been saying you know since i joined the company in january we said we would do a b and c we've done a b and c yeah we said we would drill the holes get the samples send them up to a lab we've done that we're doing that we said we would get this pea because we believe there was this credible financeable project in there that we could do without a partner the PEA backs that up, right? So we've delivered what we said we would do. Now it's a case of keep delivering it. So what does the PEA show you? It shows you that for $360 million of capital, 
you can get into production producing 110,000 ounces a year for, fifth, for the first 15 years of gold and another 2.5 million ounces a year of silver for the first 15 years with a mine life of 31 years. We haven't talked about expansions. With a 31-year mine life, the obvious thing is, why expand it, dummy? Bring those ounces forward. We'll look at that. We were looking for a credible, financeable, deliverable project that we could do as ourselves. And the PEA shows that. Yeah, 35% IRR, 1.4 billion Canadian before tax MPV. Those are great numbers by anybody's measure. It gives us the, the, the justification to keep moving forward. We've got a credible option, and now we need to flesh it out. Okay, and again, definitely come back to that point, but we're going to go straight to the area which you know, is, is the crux of the matter here is the fact, can you technically, economically extract the gold, the silver, the copper, because you're doing some tests at the moment. We've talked about it on a couple of previous occasions, right? You've, you've explained the technology that you're using. You've explained the process. In fact, last time out was a good interview. People should go back and watch that. Um, where are you with that testing now? Because you know, if you if you're coming on the show and saying, "I say what I do, do what I say," you know, has that process started? And you know, how long before we get the results? We had to drill fresh samples, right? We've got to be sure that what the samples we've got are credible, reliable, they haven't been sitting in a warehouse for 10 years you know, or something. So we drilled new holes where the ore should have been, done that, got them, sorted them out, shipping the samples up to Vancouver. We'll start the test work this month, right? It's slow. It's going to take time. We have to do the oxidation first, and then the, then the cyanide leach to get the final answers. We'll do a series of tests focused on the intrusive first and the intrusive pressure because that's the guts of the ore body. That's where all the mine plants focus. That's where the mine will start. And we'll do 30, 60, 90, 120, 180 days to get this oxidation curve. Once we've got that oxidation curve, or once we've got them oxidized for those times, we leach the columns. That gives us the gold and silver recoveries. Once I've got that curve, we'll release that. Yeah, we may even consider to prove to people that we can change grey rock into brown rock. We may even put a press release out once I've got some columns up and running that show grey rock, brown rock with some dates underneath them, and people can sit there because you know, as the old saying is, a picture paints a thousand words. This right, okay. This will show it. So, so you're. Drilling has happened. You've got the samples that you all the samples that you need. They yep. are in process, but we're talking about a a potentially six month time frame here, where every yes. thirty days along that curve, along that time frame, you're going to work out what the oxidize, oxidization curve looks like for you. I, what you think you're going to be able to extract and talk to the market. Un understood. Um, talk to me about the sulfide component, though, if, if you don't mind, um, because I'd, I'd like people to sort of understand the process that you're going through. You say, oh, we're just oxidizing gray rock, brown rock. It sounds really simple, but there's a bit more to it than that. <laughs> so the process, that, that there are indications across the industry in all in different areas. You know, we know we can oxidize sulfides, chalcosite, covalite, and pyrite in the copper industry. Built a very large one back in 2002 through 2006, which was Spence, and there's bits about that in, in, in one of the presentations. Um, it was the largest single build SXCW sulfide heat leach in the world. The copper industry today has been doing this for over 30 years. It produces somewhere between a million and a half and two million tons a year of copper using the same process, the same concepts. Um, Different, slightly different chemistry. They run acidic, we're going to run alkali, but at the end of the day, they oxidize sulfides to get the metal out. And that's what they do. And I've seen it, I've built it, I know the intimate details on what we built, how we built it, why we built it the way we did, and what needs to be there. 
In the gold space, there are actually a few processes out there today where they do the same chemistry as we're using. So the same alkali environment, oxidizing pyrite yeah, in tanks. So they grind it fine and they oxidize it in tanks. And you can say, well, that's not the same as heat bleach. And you're right, it's not. But if you go back to the concepts, time is inversely proportional to size. A big rock takes longer to oxidize than a little rock. The fact that it oxidizes is what matters. So we know from the, even in the gold industry, there is a chemistry set that allows you to oxidize pyrite or marcasite or pyrotite, but basically iron sulfides in a tank environment. We know from the copper industry, you can do it in a heat bleach environment. You put the two together and that's the technical solution that we're working towards. Okay. But in, in, in I just, I'm just intrigued by what's happening during this, this timeline. When you're analyzing the oxidization component, I mean, it, what, what happens at the end? How is the, uh, how is the gold, silver, uh, copper actually extracted? How does, how does that physically work? What, when, when, do you, when do you start um, with, the, with the kind of, you know, the cyanide component to this? And is that, by that stage, is it just a very normal, ordinary process? Or is it still part of this black art, this black box solution, <laughs> which you've got from Albion, right? How's it work? Well, it's great to brown, it's great to brown rock. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, but um, take copper out of it. Forget copper because okay. copper is actually a different issue um, and, and Metatis doesn't have much more than a trace of copper in it okay. anyway. Um, but what's happening is the pyrite is oxidizing to sulfate, iron sulfate, iron hydroxide and iron sulfate. And, and that happens naturally, happens in acidic, happens in alkali conditions happens faster when you grind it really fine, takes longer when it's in a heat bleach. Um, and you can see it because you can see the color of the product. So the fact, the reason the, the, gray, the rock goes from gray to, to brown or red or orange is basically iron hydroxides or iron oxides that, that are the product of the pyrite oxidizing. Once that pyrite oxidizes in a, in a refractory system, um, you have now, now released the gold. And so now you can get the gold and silver to dissolve in cyanide. So it's a two-step process. Oxidize it, make it nice and brown or red or orange, whichever color it decides it wants to go, depending on the iron components. And then lime cyanide, gold, meryl crow, exactly the same as every other process heat bleach out there. So because you've actually now made the gray rock, the oxide cap. Yeah, got it. You've okay. sped up nature. Understood, understood. I just wanted to understand what, you know, how to think those parts were. And when, you know, and this is what you're saying with regards to the oxidization timeline, you've got to work out where on that curve you want to step in it was the most economic and efficient process for you. Okay, understood. Yeah. Um, but I, okay, so time frame potentially six, seven months out, potentially? Yeah, Q1, Q2, Q1. Right. Next year, we'll start getting results. So what's the cash position at the moment? Because I, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is in some meaningful way, if you've got the cash to sort of set that time frame out, it doesn't really matter what liquidity does for you as a company, because as soon as you can say, turn and say, we have cracked it, we can extract this, we can get 70, 75%, whatever the number is, recoveries. The market's going to be listening to you right now until you've done that. Your PA doesn't really matter, I suspect. And looking at the, res the response today, I don't think anyone cares. Is that fair to say? I, I think that's a, a mistake that they, they don't care. We've got $35 million in the bank, or we did at the end of Q1. Q2's results aren't out yet. Um, that, that'll happen later this month, and we'll update that number. But we're not spending a lot of money. I mean, five holes doesn't cost you a lot. We're a very, very small team. I think there's like five or six of us plus another 10 in Mexico. That's it. So our overhead is low. Our spend rate is low. 
Um, you know, we, we've got the metallurgical test program. We've obviously got to pay for the PEA. But you're talking un, well under $10 million a year at the rate we're going. And so with $35 million, I, I won't say I don't care because I obviously would like to see a response that the market is interested in what we're trying to do. But I don't need more money. I've got the money I need to do the work I need to do to actually even get me beyond the pre-feasibility study. We believe we've got enough to get us all the way to the end of the feasibility study and into the financing stage. So that includes the, the environmental impact work, the infill drilling, all of the test work, the pre-feasibility study, the feasibility study, the whole work program that's in the in the presentation up to the start of construction. But you, then but, we need money. Yeah, I get it. But, but you, Alan, you know what I'm saying here, because but you're the new guy in the block, right? You've come in with this technology. Mm -hmm. The previous company was a, was, a, was a star. And then when it, people thought that there's no way these guys can actually extract gold economically from this recovery rates at you know, mid-teens, people are disinterested in it. And you're, you've still kind of got that legacy issue here. So you're going through a process. Um, so I just want to understand, during the six, seven month time frame, will you every 30 days be able to assess, well, you know, recovery is based on what I see in front of me here could no. be X. It's going to be a number at the end of the process. Is that it? No, I, I, I want to deliver a more complete view. Rather than putting out a single column every 30 days and then try and explain what's going on, I would rather have a set. So here are all the intrusive tests, 30, 60, 90, 120, 180. We've picked X day because that appears to be the economic best point where we got this recovery to these costs. That's what we're going to use in the design criteria for the PFS. Um, rather than put out a 30-day column and people go, but you only got 25% recovery or whatever the number is. And they'll go, well, yeah, it's only 30 days, guys. Wait until the 60-day column or the 90-day column. So put out a set. It's easier to explain a complete set of results than dribble. I understand. And that makes Perfect sense, but I just wanted to be clear so everyone can understand what to expect. Um, yeah. So the costs, costs are under control. You've got a plan going forward. If you get to the point where you say, "Well, look, we've got some, we've got the kind of re recovery rates that we think make this not just economic, but really, really interesting," um, you kind of scale back the 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 plan of attack, right? You reduce the mm -hmm. the capex. It's, it's like about one tenth of the of the the, the previous um, capex figure. Can you ramp things up quickly if you chose to? Two two different sorts of answers. Ramping up earlier, I'm a little loath to not do a feasibility study. You, you've got to do the work up front. Too many people have tried to skip feasibility studies and got burnt. Yeah, their contingency was too low because we did a risk analysis or whatever argument they used to justify it. Not doing a proper feasibility study does not give you a proper execution plan. Spend the money. It's not a lot. Do it right. Because it's, I think I said before to you one time, you know, I'd rather get it right the first time than be fixing it afterwards. That is, that is really, really painful. Um, so, so I don't want to compress it so much that I start skipping steps. You've got to do it right. However, at 15,000 at 15, tons a day, and we already know where we would put a second oxidation pan. So it's expandable, which is one of the, one of the key things I said. Credible, financeable, deliverable. 15,000 ton a day is not big. Expandable. We already know how we would double it, and we could double it in the in the in the deck that's on the website. There's a couple of hours, one where we put phase two at year seven or something. But we basically looked at when does the production dip and then come back up. Oh, that's the obvious place to put your expansion in. Could we do it sooner than that? Yeah, we could do it day three if we if we were that confident that it's all up and running and working nicely. 
Yeah. So, you know, we would do an expansion as soon as it makes sense. Once we are able to prove and show proper operational production consistent over several quarters. And then all of the doubting Thomases, I'll just sit there and say, well, there you go. Yeah, there's the gold, there's the process, there's the brown rock. We're now expanding and we're going to go to double that. And double would be the obvious first expansion. Yeah, so you go from 15 to 30, down from 31, 32 years to 18 years. But you still got the option, or someone else, I suspect, with a bigger balance sheet would have the option of going back to the original plan. Yeah, that's, that's a great observation. That, that plan is still a valid project. There is all of the support work, all of the data to say that a conventional open pit mill or the clay plant will give you 95% recovery, gold and silver, build it at the size they were looking at. It's a 400,000 ounce a year producer. The issue is we can't fund it. So, you know, if, if Barrick or Newmont suddenly wants to another 400, 500,000 ounce a year production, sure, that's, it's a valid project. It's still a valid project. And $1,800 gold, it looks way better than it did at 1,200. It's, it's true, but it brings me neatly onto um, something which you touched upon earlier, which I wanted to I wanted to speak to you about, which is you're about two seventy uh, million Canadian at, at the moment. Mm-hmm. Your 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 PNAV, well over a billion. I mean, you're getting close to the point where this is financeable for you, but you're going to really need to see some movement in your valuations to be able to get funders to take you credibly. And is that just a factor of what the test it comes back to the test results again, doesn't it? I think so. I think so. You know, it, it's it's always it's always a show me story, right? And ours probably more so some, than some of the others, because of the test work, the new technology. Everybody's always a little shy around that. Um, but I think once once we start getting the test work results, once I can show, you know, picture paints a thousand words, once I can show a couple of pictures of grey with a date, brown with a date, um, I think that will help a lot. And then as the results come out of the test work, that helps the infill drilling, put it all together in a PFS that has support for every number that's in there. And don't get me wrong, the PEA has support for a lot of the numbers that are there. And I don't think anybody can accuse me of being aggressive on any of the numbers, the capital numbers, the mining costs, the operating costs. You know, I, I always have in the back of my mind, I'm going to deliver this. And people have long memories. So if I said it's going to cost me X, don't come back in two years and say it's now X plus 50. Yeah. You know? That that won't get you any friends. Yep. No, so, no, no, it doesn't. And that, that, that's the nature of, of investors. You know, you, you you tell them what you're going to do, and, and you deliver it. And you've got to keep doing that. You have done so far, yeah. but you've got to keep doing that. Um, well, look. I, I, last question, which is so. What, remind me again. What are we looking at for? I know the test work. You've kind of outlined the time for it, but in terms of the other stuff that you're going to be spending money on this year, other things that you're going to come back and talk to me about before the end of the year are what. Um, so the other things, it, it's all, it's, it keeps coming back to the test work, but also this infill drilling is important because it could add a lot to the value of the project in the beginning. And that's what matters, both when you're trying to get it financed and obviously when you start up and pay back your capital, it helps with your payback, helps with the IIRR, helps with the banks understanding that we can pay debt if we go and get some debt. Um, that those are really the two main things going forward uh, this year, and then next year is with all the results, the PFS, um, the the environmental impact statement. Basically, you're on that that development plan that we've put in the in the um, presentation. Okay. Well, um, I look forward to you know you coming on and telling us a little bit more around it. I'm I'm, I'm excited about 
moving towards some sort of feasibility. And PAs are great. They tell you what the project could be, just says what it could be. But in terms yep. of, you know, it's an, it's an indication. I'm, I'm intrigued as to what you're going to be able to do next and what you're going to be able to show in terms of the margin. Because we've had lots of questions sent in about, you know, in terms of economies to be gained by, you know, expansion plans and, you know, how you go about um, doing the business of mining and strip ratios and so forth. But I think right now, for me, it's all about the test results and everything that you're doing that feeding into that. Yeah, the PEA justifies to keep moving forward. Exactly. Right? It, it's a big enough prize, and that's why we did it. We wanted to show investors that the prize is actually worth the effort, the time, and the money to keep moving forward. Yeah, and so the drill results were a nice surprise. Great, we'll, we'll work on that too. But the PEA justifies me spending money for the rest of this year and next year to get to pre-feasibility study with the right. test work results backing it up. And we've got the money to do that yeah. either way. Exactly. We're going to move from what it could be to what it should be. And that's the bit where I start paying attention to this project. Alan, yeah. as always, a pleasure talking to you. Uh, stay in touch. Let us know how you get on, okay? Will do. Thanks for your time, Matt. Talk to you again.